Hey y'all, this is the teacher under the stairs. I mean, literally, my office is under the stairs. <laughs> I'm Miss Kay, and this is my very first video on YouTube. Uh, a little nervous about it, but um, I just wanted to welcome you all to my channel. And today, um, just to get started, I'm gonna be doing a read aloud, just for fun. But um, I can and will do any literature works for junior high, high school, or college. All you have to do is comment below what um, literature works you might like me to read, and I can do um, explanations at the end of each chapter. We can have discussion. I'm also um, able to, I will link my um, email address down below if y'all would like to schedule tutoring sessions for um, different things in English or writing. I'm available for that. Um, and I will be starting a Facebook group. I just haven't yet, like you can see, I didn't even get to make up today. I've been putting this off for so long. I understand procrastination and uh, I just wanted to go ahead and get started and things will improve. I have plans for my background, plans for better lighting, uh, plans for better video quality, <laughs> uh, but I thought I might as well just jump in because if I keep putting it off, I don't know, I'm probably like a lot of y'all, I'll never get that, get it done. So. Um, I will also include fun reads, and I've taught, I'm a certified teacher, I've taught high school English for years, and um, even my kids that have already graduated still tell me, and they're off like married and doing their own things now, how much they enjoyed when I would read out loud to them in class. So if you're a mom or dad or aunt or uncle or grandparent, really kids like to be read to, doesn't matter what age they are. And so today what I selected, because I'm a huge giant uh, shark nerd, and I loved, I read like all of Steve Alton's, um, it's backwards, but all of Steve Alton, Alton's books before the movie ever came out, I thought I would read a little bit of the first chapter of The Trench, and um, this was published in, doo -doo 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 -doo, let me find it. I just love his books, by the way. He is amazing. Okay, this was public copyrighted in 1999. And again, it's by Steve Alton, and it's one of the books in the series from the Meg. So I'm gonna go ahead and start reading that for y'all. Mariana Trench, 12 degrees north latitude. Oop, my reading glasses. Getting old is not for the faint of heart. Mariana Trench, 12 degrees north latitude, 144 degrees east longitude, March 22, 22, 2001. Retired Navy deep pilot Barry Lease wiped the sweat from his palms as he checked the depth indicator on the Proteus. 34,718 feet, nearly seven miles of water above their heads, 16,000 pounds per square inch of water surrounding them. Just stop thinking about it. Barry glanced around the tight quarters of the four-man submersible. Racks of computer monitors, electronics, and a bewildering jungle of wires filled the pressurized hull. The watertight coffin barely had room for its crew. Below the navigation console, team leader Ellis Richard and his assistant, Linda Heron, stared out through the tiny portholes on the floor of the Proteus's bow. See those animals with the furry cream, green pelt, Linda asked. Those are Pompeii worms, capable of withstanding temperature variations from 22 degrees all the way to 81 degrees Celsius. The hydrothermal vents supply the sulfur for bacteria to live off of, which in turn are digested by the tube worms. Linda, where are the source of food to all these bizarre looking life forms? Linda, enough with the goddamn biology lessons, Ellis said. Sorry, embarrassed, the petite geologist turned back to the porthole, cupping her hands around her eyes to eliminate the glare. Smiling to himself, the sub's fourth crewman, Kali Habash, looked down from his console at Linda. That girl loved to talk, especially when she was nervous, a quality the Arab never hesitated to exploit. Kali's real name was Ari Levy, a Jew born and raised in Syria, but it had been nearly 10 years since the day Ari had been recruited by Mossad, Israel's covert intelligence agency. Since that time, he had led a double life, spending half his time in Israel with his wife and three children, traveling around the Arab world in Russia, 
the rest of the time posing as a plasma physicist. It had taken four hard years of sacrifice for the agent to infiltrate Benedict Singer's organization. But here he was, seven miles beneath the Pacific, about to learn secrets that could change humanity forever. Airy checked the external temperature gauge. Hey, Linda, can you believe the water is 78 degrees? The girl perked up again. Incredible, isn't it? We call it hydrothermal megaplumes. The hot mineral water pumping out of these black smokers is 700 degrees. As it rises, it warms the freezing seawater column until it reaches neutral buoyancy at about 1,200 feet above the floor of the trench. Ocean currents then spread the plume laterally. The floating layer of soot from the minerals creates a ceiling that acts like insulation, scaling a tropical layer of water along the bottom of the gorge. The layer never cools? Never. The hydrothermal vents are chronic plumes. They have been active since the Cretaceous period. Ellis Richards checked his watch again. As project's team leader, he was perpetually worried about falling behind schedule. Christ, three hours and it seems like we've barely made any headway. Linda, is it just me or does it seem like the pilot has no idea what he's doing? <clears throat> Barry, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> sorry. Okay, Barry Lease ignored the insult. He checked his sonar and cursed under his breath. They had moved too far ahead of the Benthos, Geotex Industries, GTI mobile deep sea lab community and submarine docking station the billion dollar mothership rep resembled a domed sports arena with a false flat surface for an underbelly dangling three mammoth shock absorbers for legs hovering just above the turbulent sea floor in neutral buoyancy the 46,000 square foot titanium structure reminded Leis of a monstrous man of war as it followed them north on the most hostile through the most hostile environment on the planet. Barry Lease had served on three different submarines during his tenure in the Navy. He had long ago become accustomed to living in claustrophobic quarters beneath the waves. Not everyone could make it as a submariner. One had to be in tip-top mental and physical shape, able to perform while knowing that drowning in the darkness within the steel ships hundreds of fathoms below the surface was just an accident away. Barry had that fortitude, that mental toughness, proving it time and time again during his 26 years of service. That was why he was surprised at how easy his psyche was unraveling within the Mariana Trench. Confidence that had been nurtured through thousands of hours of submarine duty had suddenly dissipated the moment the Proteus cleared its abysmal docking bay aboard the Benthos. Truth be known, it wasn't the depths that unnerved him. Four years earlier, through man's intervention, Car Chardon Megalodon, I'm not sure if I said that right, a prehistoric 60 foot species of great white shark, had risen from this very trench to wreak havoc. Although the albino nightmare had eventually been destroyed and its surviving offspring captured, at least a dozen people had died within its seven foot jaws. There, where there was one creature, there might be more. Despite all of Geotech's precautions and technical innovations, the submersible pilot was still just a bundle of nerves. Barry pulled back on the throttle controls, slowing the main propulsion engine. He had no desire to get too far of their abysmal escort. What is it now, Captain? Ellis asked. Why are we slowing? The temperature's rising again. We must be approaching another series of hydrothermal vents. The last thing I want to want is to collide with one of those black smokers. The team leader squeezed his eyes shut in frustration. God damn it. Barry pressed his face against the porthole, eluding Ellis's tirade. The submersible lights illuminated a petrified forest of sulfur and mineral deposits. The towering stacks rising 30 feet or, or more from the bottom, dark billowing clouds of superheated mineral-rich water, gushed from the mouths of the bizarre chimneys. Airy watched Ellis Richards move menacingly toward the pilot's navigational console. Captain, let's get something straight. I'm in charge of this mission, not you. My orders are for us to cover no less than 20 miles a day. Something we'll never come close to at the snail's pace. Better safe than sorry, Mr. Richards. I don't want to get too far ahead of the Benthos. 
at least not until I get a feel for this sub, a feel for, I thought you were an experienced pilot. I am, Barry said. That's why I'm slowing down. Linda looked up from her porthole. Exactly how far ahead of the Benthos are we, Captain? Just over six kilometers. Six kilometers? That's all? Benedict Singer is going to flip. Ellis Richard looked like he was about to have an aneurysm. Look, Captain, the Prometheus and the Epi Epi <laughs> Epimetheus, Epithemius, Epithemius, are expected to arrive topside early next week. Neither submersible can even begin its work until we complete ours. I know that. You should. GTI is paying you a king's ransom to pilot the Proteus. We can't keep waiting for the Benthos to play catch-up every time we go out. We'll add another 30 days or more to our timetable, which is completely unacceptable. So is dying, Mr. Richards. My job is to keep us alive in this hellhole and not take chances so that you can earn your bonus by coming in ahead of schedule. The team leader stared at him. You're scared, aren't you, Captain? Ellis? No, Linda. I'm right. Airy watched the dynamics unfold. In the few weeks he had been on the Abyss, the Mossad agent had observed Ellis Richards to be an obstinate man who preferred the use of bully tactics rather than concede that he might be wrong. Through mankind, one of those crazy words that can go either way, though mankind knew more about distant galaxies than about the Mariana Trench, which is still true, Richards proclaimed himself as an expert on the abyss, somehow knowing everything from its hidden geology to its mysterious life forms. Captain Lee glared back at Ellis. I have a healthy dose of fear inside of me, if that's what you mean. It's obvious that neither one of you fully appreciates the dangers of working 35, in 35,000 feet of water. Try to understand if something should go wrong, if we should accidentally hit something, or if something hits us. There is no watertight doors to seal and no standard operating procedures to follow in event of a hull breach. You won't even have time to bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. Sounds to me like you've lost your nerve, Ellis said. What did you say? What do you think, Kabosh? Has our captain lost his nerve? Considering that the surviving descendants of the Megalodon are living somewhere within this gorge, I must respect the captain's opinion. Airy said. At the same time, we have more than 60,000 square miles of seafloor to search. Our surface ship's towed sonar array was designed to alert us of any approaching life forms in plenty of time to retreat back to the safety of the Benthos. Plenty of time, Barry shook his head amazement. in amazement. How in the hell do we know at which speed that life form might approach? Besides, the Goliaths in the midst of gale forth seas, topside interference is disrupting communications. In that case, I suggest we collide our first samples here. In that case, I suggest we collect our first samples here and give the Benthos a chance to catch up. Once the water calms, I'm sure we'll find a way to make up for lost time. Barry shot Linda an exasperated look before returning to his console. He double-checked the acoustic transponders, took another quick glance at his viewport, and then gauged the lateral thrusters. Maneuvering between several black smokers, the Proteus descended slowly, establishing neutral buoyancy just above the cluster of the glowing tube worms. The entanglement of mouthless 14-foot life forms writhed <laughs> in the current like serpents on Medusa's head. I promise y'all I'll get better th at this. I just get super nervous about being on video. Not so much when I'm teaching through Zoom, but like I said, this is my first video. So anyway, I'm in I'm initiating our gas chromatography detectors, Ari said. We should cut our mission time in half. We can detect helium isotopes leaking from these hydrothermal vents. Fine, fine, just do it, Ella said, struggling with the laptop contr controls that operated the sub's robotic arms. Using the sub's underwater camera to see, Ellis began manipulating the two central control knobs, causing the twin robot arms to extend from beneath the sub. Gingerly, he directed the pinchers of, of the left arm, snagging the isotherm sampling basket from its storage area. Captain Liace watched the robotic arms extend towards the seabed, 
their movements stirring the bottom into clouds of mud. He closed his eyes and he tried to relax, listening to the hydraulic whine of the pinchers. Move to your left, Linda said, directing Ellis from her viewport, just beyond that tube worm cluster. Loud warning blips from the sonar caused the pilot's head to skip a beat. He grabbed the acoustal printout and then checked the sonar screen in disbelief. A tight cluster of, of objects had materialized. Large objects. The captain felt his throat tighten. The others continued working, not even bothering to look up. Habash, we've got company. Airy turned. What is it? Sonar reported three unidentified objects bearing 015, range 7.4 kilometers, speed 15 knots and closing, heading directly for us. Any word from the surface? I'm trying now. No response. We're on our own. What do you suggest, Airy? Suddenly felt a little bit claustrophobic himself. Barry stared out at the sonar console. I say we get the hell out of here. Richards, retract the robotic arms. We're returning immediately to the benthos. You've got to be kidding. Captain, are you certain? Linda registered a knot of fear in her stomach. Look for yourself. Whatever these creatures are, they'll ac they're accelerating through the trench in our direction. Richards, I say retract those mechanical arms. And I'm saying, bleep you. You know, YouTube. It's taken me 20 minutes to collect these sample samples, and I'll be damned if we're going anywhere before I secure the back, the bucket back on board. Barry moved the sonar console, stared at the three images. He thought about his training sessions. Were Megalodons pack hunters? Maybe it's just a school of fish, Linda suggested. Try to stay calm. A school of fish? Stick to geology, Linda. Sonar indicates these things are more than 40 feet long. Out of my way. Barry ignited the lateral festers. Steady, not too fast. Don't hit anything or you rupture the hull. The sub spun counterclockwise. A bone rattling shock. A bone rattling shook the Proteus. God damn it, Lee Salas yelled. You've nearly tore the mechanical arm off. I just lost every sample. I told you to retract the arms. Barry accelerated the Proteus to its top speed of 1.8 knots. He knew the benthos was moving toward them somewhere out there in the darkness. The blips grew stronger. ETA, 32 minutes. Airy thought we're too far out. Captain, listen to me, Linda said grabbing his arm. They're not sharks. Barry stared ahead. So you're a biologist now? I think Linda is right, Airy said, Try to reason with, trying to reason with his own fear. Listen, Habash, whatever these things are, they're a hell of a lot bigger and a hell of a lot faster than the Proteus. The blips grew faster. Airy's heart raced to keep pace. This is absurd, Ella said. Barry ignored him and leaned forward. Staring through the porthole into the abyss, the smoke rising from the hydrothermal vents made it difficult to see beyond the perimeter. He shielded his, shielded his eyes and strained to focus. Long minutes passed in silence, a darting movement ahead, another to the starboard, very swift, very large. They're here, the captain whispered, a lump in his throat, fast blinkers. For a long moment, no one said a word. The only sound came from the Proteus's propeller. With a sudden jolt, the sub pitched to starboard. Barry crashed face first into his console. What's happening, Ella said. What did you hit? I didn't hit anything. They hit us. Barry struggled with the navigational controls. She's not responding. Something's wrong. Shh, Linda whispered. From above their heads, they heard a faint sound, metal groaning. Oh, Christ, one of them is on top. Barry listened at sonar, studying the screen. Liace, do something, Ellis ordered. Hold on. The pilot swung the submersible hard to port and then back to starboard, trying to shake the creature off. Captain, stop. That plate's loosening, screamed Linda. The sound of grinding metal screeched along the top of the hull. The pilot reached up and touched one of the titanium rivets welded to the plate above his head. He felt moisture. And tasted his fingers. Seawater, he moaned. 
He leaned forward, praying to the benthos to peer in his viewport. The sound of shearing metal grated in their ears as the Proteus dipped sideways. Son of a blank, the captain wiped the threat f sweat from his face. They're tearing the blanking tail fin loose. Linda pushed her face against her viewport. Where's the benthos? Something huge broadsided the sub, hurtling stacks of recording equipment against the far wall. Captain, I think I know what they're doing, Ari shouted. The two smaller ones are driving us towards their larger companion. These things are intelligent? Look, Linda yelled out the porthole. Barry could just make an ominous shape moving towards them. It's the benthos. You don't have time to dock, Ari warmed. Signal the benthos to open the hangar doors. It takes five minutes to flood the chamber, Linda shouted. The pilot grabbed the radio. Mayday, mayday, Benthos, this is Proteus. Request you open hangar doors immediately. Proceed to the docking area, Prote Proteus. God damn it, open the blanking hangar doors now. Standing beneath the loosening rivets, arms above his head, Airy Levy felt the titanium plate reverberate against his sweating palms. Whatever these things are, they're tearing the entire section loose. A whistling sound infiltrated the cabin. What's that? Barry Lies looked up, releasing the integrity of the plates. Captain Airy yelled, the third creature. A tremendous force sucked, struck the sub's bow, flinging Linda and Ellis to the floor. Barry Lies plunged over his navigational console, his head striking the viewport glass, blood flowing from his brow. He wiped it clear, staring in horror. A luminous crimson eye peered in through the glass. Airy pulsed his palm futilely against the titanium plate reverberating above his head. He thought about the information he had fought so long to acquire but had not been able to report. He thought about his wife and children whom he had forsaken in the line of duty. The whistling sound above his head ceased. A pair of twisted rivets split into the cabin like five caliber machine gun slugs. The Mossad's agent imploded before the rivets hit the floor. And that is the end of chapter one of The Trench. And I will upload this video and we will do chapter two of The Trench um, until I start getting some suggestions on some literature works that y'all might like me to read and go over with you. And um, anyway, it was fun. I appreciate you taking this time. And, if, and as all YouTubers say, if you like what I'm doing, Please hit like, and if you want to know when I upload more videos, please hit the bell so you'll be notified when I upload new videos. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.